All right, baby, here we go. Somebody's podcast. We back in the building. We live. We jumping right into it. How we feeling? How we feeling, Jay? We good? Feeling good now that I got that fucking phone situated over there. Okay, here. okay. Jay was in full panic because we're, we're going live on uh on on Rocco's his, IG. Rocco's IG. Rocco. Rocco is our guest. We're gonna get into him in a second. My man Eddie C. How we doing, baby? I'm good. I'm just I'm just messing around with this mic. I'm kind of uh, lost right now. <laughs> I feel like it was different last week, and now I'm like. You ever feel awkward? You're talking into something, and I don't know what to do with my hands right now, but I'm good. Thank you, baby. How you doing? <laughs> yeah, you're looking over at me like you got a neck brace on. Like you're fucking, I don't hear his name, but it's like, I don't not know. Not allowed to move your chin. I, I had one of those on Friday. <laughs> yo, yeah. Yo. <laughs> so, yo. Already, we have to... I, honestly, I like the way this one feels, because we, we're starting out the gate with fucking technical difficulties. Dude, got a sprained my sprained ankle and paralyzed his... face. Like, <laughs> yeah. I sprained my ankle. Uh, <laughs> Somebody's oh, podcast, if you don't know what it is, this is a recovery-based podcast, a lifestyle podcast, a motivational podcast. It's just, uh, just some buddies getting together, trying to give you some inspiration, uh, trying to share some experience, strength, and hope. And uh, we got my usual suspects, my usual co-host, my man, J-Mac. What up, man? What up? Mr. Street Smart, streetsmart.com. We got my man, oh, Eddie Street C. Smart Studio. Ooh, streetsmartstudio.com. Yes. yes. And we got a guest here, man. We got a guest. We got my man, Rocco, here. He's in the building. And uh, I'm pretty excited, man. It's not often that I get a guest on here that I don't know a ton about. I've heard about him, and I heard of uh, a lot of what he's doing, and, um, and especially for, like, this podcast, too, like um, what, we're trying to, what we're trying to share, you know, what we're trying to put out there. And um, it's to to change the uh, the limited belief systems, the barriers that we have mentally, especially in the recovery world, right? And I talk about it all the time. There's this there's this thing like we talk about getting clean and staying clean, and especially people struggling from active addiction. But there's a secondary component to that that I tell people all the time, which is the development of a life worth living. And uh, and and that may sound foreign to a lot of people, but when you understand this process, like I understand it, and these gentlemen understand it, is that when we work on ourselves and we sort through that clutter to get to our clarity, and we unlock the sunlight of the spirit, we can start to get into a place where we're going through life looking for meaning, right? And that's that comes with a a, a decision to suffer for something, right? Because suffering is an inevitable part of life. It's either we suffer moving backwards, suffer sitting still doing nothing, or we suffer moving forward and uh, ultimately looking for that meaning that path and purpose and um so whenever someone turns their life around and whenever someone goes to that place right where they go into the pits of hell and they come out and uh and then they make a conscious decision that that they're going to take that and 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 in that pain and, and and everything that they've gone through and utilize it as motivation to to push forward and not to push forward just to settle for less right because mediocrity kills fucking mm. people like me and uh other people that i know it's like they 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 open up the peanut size that ideas of what their life could become to the possibilities if anything and uh that shit's powerful to me, right? And and this podcast is a platform to let you know that ultimately, although your mind may be telling you in this current moment that type of shit like that isn't possible for you, mm. we're here to tell you that that's bullshit. That's a narrative that's been created over the course of your life that's trying to keep you in a limited position because it's very easy to say fuck it when you don't believe that there's a life out there for you to truly live within. Mm. And uh, oh, man, so Rock was going to tell us that. Yeah, yeah, and and welcome. <laughs> uh, we invited you on this podcast so you could listen to me talk. <laughs> no, I'm just so, fucking with you. No, I'm, well, it's a lying, segue. Literally. No, no, no. Right. I'm gonna because right. what he's doing is powerful, man. And and Jay sent me a um a, a write up of everything that you do, and 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 you're an entrepreneur. Um, you've come through adversity. You're a man in long term recovery, and obviously, I want you to talk about that too. But it's also like you took your life and you turned it around, and now you're using that to go out and influence. You're walking back into the pits of hell, and you're grabbing people by the hand, and you're showing them, and you're showing them like there's there's a, another way, and that that uh, you too can develop this life worth living. So, um, I, I like you to to, to kind of like touch base with us. You know what I mean? Let us know how you go from that place of like the darkness into the light. Now I know that you have uplift, which is, which is a brand that, that, that gives back. I know you're a barber. I know you're a fucking Reiki master. Medi yeah. All that shit, man. And that to me is a, he's is a an dad. individual, a, he's dad. a dad now. That's a man that's in the process, a true process of an evolution of self. And I love that. If you look at my arm, it gives me goosebumps because this shit, like, I believe in this more than I believe in anything else in my life. And you're a fucking example. And that's what we're trying to do here is to, is to give that to people, right? That, that motivation. So uh, why, why don't you 
give us a little background info and 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 just shut me the fuck up, dude, because I please, won't stop talking. Please, Marshall, shut Chris's mic off. Yeah. <laughs> Can you hear me good? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, first and foremost, thank you guys for having me tonight. Absolutely. Um, been looking forward to this podcast for a while. Mm. You know, to spread the good word uh, and living example. On my way here, you know, I was a little bit tired. I just suffered a loss in the family this past week, and um, sorry, sorry for that. Yeah, it's sorry. good. You know, God rest my aunt. But um, you know, one of the biggest quotes in my life and my journey, especially in my recovery, um, that always stuck with me was. You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Amen. But you can mm. lead a horse to a well and make him thirsty. Mm. And, uh, you know, my life with my lifestyle and the people that I break bread with, especially Jay. And, you know, I consider everybody in this room family at this point because we live by the same principles. We're trying to be that, you know, part of my French, that motherfucking Gatorade, mm. that thirst quencher to feed that thirst and spread the power of example and hope, you know, because this is life or death. You know, um, you can live in your head. You know, Jay always told me, you know, you can have those negative mindset and try to think positive, but you got to put it into positive action. And, you know, that's what Uplift stands for in my life. It's a lifestyle. It's not just a hair product um, to uplift others, whether that's altruistic acts, open the door for somebody, pick up that trash, reach out to a friend that you know needs it, smile, you know. The devil likes to play tricks in your brain, you mm. know, especially with the egos. I don't have time for small minds or egos. I'm not trying to battle with anybody. I'm no better than anybody else. You know, my number one competition is myself. Mm. You know, uh, power of example, living, you know, being behind a chair at the shop for all those hours with my team. And, you know, after my car accident, I couldn't look myself in the mirror for a long time. I had a lot of guilt, guilt after my uh, two sisters had passed and, um, my own addiction, as well as my brother's, but to really be able to look at myself in the mirror and be proud of who I am today. And that's not arrogance, you know. That's me knowing that I can live through my self-reflection and put it into work by helping other people, being mindful, being present for those that need me, you know. And I am not perfect, but, you know, if there's a booger in your nose, you got to have friends like Jay that can tell you where to go and, that's you right. know, really reflect. Got me wondering. Yeah, somebody's got to pick that. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> somebody's got to pick that. So you were, you were talking about it earlier, Rocco. How, how long do you have clean in sobriety? Uh, going on six years in September. Come on, man. That's big yeah. stuff. Hell That's yeah. That's big stuff. Hell yeah. yeah. I, I want to touch. So you, you have family members that struggle with um with uh, addiction? Correct. And it's, do you believe that it's, um, it's hereditary? I believe it's a disease. Um, you know, whether that's in the blood or not, you know, uh, doesn't matter the circumstances of one's life. It doesn't discriminate. You know, it's not a, you know, money issue. It's not a status issue. It's not a religion issue. It's not a political issue. Um, you know, living in a family that has, it has been riddled, um, with addiction, you know, um, I believe you have a choice and I try to live in my life, you know, without regret because I don't regret anything that's happened to me up until this point because I wouldn't be sitting in this room with you guys. I believe in everything happening for the reason. And um, I enjoy the bumps because I like to feel the road as to speak, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I come from a lineage of, of uh, addicts and alcoholics, right? So I, I'm one of the people I actually do believe it's hereditary. It's my Same. my father died of of this disease. His father died of this disease. My grandfather is actually fucking like forty five years in recovery. Um, and and my sister struggled with it. It's there's I have a lineage of it, you know. And 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 part of what what I'm uh, my sense of gratitude is we're able to break the cycle, right? And and obviously like uh, we don't have the choice of like our upbringing, our circumstances, the situation, or having it be hereditary it still comes with us to ultimately take action in order to change. And um, I just know that a, a, a big part of my motivation, uh, especially in recovery, was to break that cycle, right? And, and, I, and I hear that like when you were talking about that story of um, obviously loss, you know, and, um, and, and how we have to take that uh, and, and, and it's painful and use that as a motivating factor, right, to do the next right thing, to, to be able to push forward when we don't want to. Right. Because uh, uh, we talked about this last week. Uh, a lot of this recovery process is 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 doing positive things kind of without your own permission and against mm. your will. 
you know, because it's not like you wake up every day and you're like gung ho captain about this. But when you uh, identify a point of reference, right, and uh, and and you you you've identified like okay, this is this is uh, the purpose. This is what I'm doing this for. And and for me in the beginning, it was like my my identification, my point of reference was like I don't want to 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 be my dad. Mm. You know what I mean? I don't want to. I don't, I don't want to, to, to have that same destiny. Right. And I don't want to be his dad. And, and so that was a bit of a motivating factor. And obviously your points change in why you're doing this, because it's, it's like when we're in search for meaning and purpose, there's a lot of clutter that has to be deciphered through before we could get to re, get reacclimated with self to understand what is it, what it is that we're actually um, trying to attain or accomplish. And over time, things, things, things change and we, we, it becomes clearer. So like in your process, like when you started off was like a motivating factor, was that one of those things? And then did you develop down the line, like ideas of like, obviously this is, this is amazing shit. You know what I mean? Like having your own barbershop, having your own brand and, and within that brand, helping people, helping people struggling with, with Sud. Uh, when in that part, when in your process, did you start to identify these, these things or when did they become like, for me, I call it like God calls I answer, right? When you start to do the work, you start to get spiritual intuitions, right? And, and God kind of starts uh, uh, calling the shots and leading you. And did you have those moments? Yeah. Um, I believe if you do the right thing, the right things happen. I also believe in community. Um, mm. You know, the person who brought me to my knees, you know, to initially start the steps was my next door neighbor. They used to watch me, you know, do what I was doing and... Um, almost losing my brother a couple of weeks after we buried our sister and, you know, watching these kids, my nieces and nephews, they need a role models. They need role models. These kids need role models. Um, I think the biggest thing, you know, is having that network. Um, you know, my best friend, Luke, he's got nine years sobriety. He's a father of four. We go oh, in the yeah. barbership together. Shout uh, out to Luke. Yeah, shout out to Luke. Um, my fiance, she's sober. You know, my best friend's sober i uh my brother's sober you know you want to be successful you hang out with success successful people you want mm. to be sober you hang out with sober people um you know and not to block me from other people and and mental health is a big part of this and uh to go through those obstacles but you know when i found god or at least myself and was when i really humbled myself and i started hitting my knees and um, slowing it down, you know, whether you're a religious person or spiritualist, you know, I believe if you hit your knees, it humbles you, right? It's like a little kid, like I have my daughter who we watch crawl all over the place. And, you know, if she falls, we're watching her. And, you know, we're the first one she's waiting to, you know, turn her, her shoulder over to get picked up. That's how I feel when I hit my knees in the morning for God. Yeah. You know, as I hit my knees, like I'm a little kid um, and, you know, I need somebody to pick me up, uplift me. You know, and um, I need to put my my armor on, so to speak, whether that's getting quiet with myself. Like even today, you know, going to the gym, um, you know, I play a big role in my family, even though I'm the youngest of seven. Um, you know, but I went through the car wash today and put a meditation on. That's three minutes of my my time for me to get quiet with myself and self-reflect. You know, I, I need to be called out on my actions sometimes. Um, and I like that because I like a challenge. You know, I, I like to be around people that challenge me. I like to challenge people. Um, and I think that's the beauty of life is, uh, is knowledge. Knowledge is power. And how do you get to knowledge? By humbling yourself to be a student as, as we live daily, you know. so I really love, uh, <clears throat> I love you bring up the, the hot topic of um, mental health. I love when people do that because it's something that I've really been becoming more and more passionate about in recovery. Is like working in recovery and seeing it. And, um, you know, for me, I don't suffer from mental health. And it was hard enough for me to get clean for years. Uh, I feel God equipped me for, with, with the instruments that I needed in my brain in order to, to get recovery. And it was hard for me to get it, right? Like, and, uh, and I've been noticing a lot um, of the mental health and the people in the recovery community that do suffer from, from uh you know, a lot of different mental health issues. And and, it, and it's making my heart, like it hurts my heart. Mom, FaceTime video. Is mo mom's FaceTime Mom, right mom's now? Mom's FaceTime. Hold on, I Ma, gotta answer got, this. Yeah, Hold you on. Got... Hey, you're, you're, you're literally calling as I'm on the podcast. Ma, you just Hey, Lisa. Me. Yeah, everybody sees you. So yeah, <laughs> Ma, you're actually going to be on Ma, it. Ma, you this just. Yeah. Ma, you just interrupted us. 
Yeah. But we love you so much, so we don't even care. I love you. I'll call you after. Bye, Lisa. I'm filming right now. Yeah. <laughs> you are on this episode, Lisa. You're literally yeah. on the episode, Mom. Yeah, Mom. Yeah. <laughs> love you. Bye. <laughs> Oh man, that was great! Shout out to my mom. Yeah, yep. shout, shout out, out to Lisa. Shout out to, <laughs> to mom. Uh, she's uh, she's fucking somebody's biggest fan right there, <laughs> yeah. boy. That's epic. She'll be critiquing me no, and everything. Mm, I didn't like your energy was off on this one. Mm. Mm. No, she's gonna, like, yeah. she gonna be like, I don't even like the way you answered the phone. That's yeah. how off your energy yeah. was. But um, my bad, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you no either. problem. But get get getting back getting back to it is uh, it's something that I become passionate. But like uh, just from your story and what you just shared there briefly. What are, what are, what are some of your like concerns or, or you know tips and tricks if you will like for people getting into recovery that that do suffer from mental health what are some like you know tips some advice that you you could give people as far as a route like you know different things to look into warning signs red flags like you know I I did uh, work for a couple of treatment centers over the last year and. Um I was able to really like see what you guys see daily, you know, and uh, treatment centers were um, co-ed and all different ages. And, you know, you'd see the dual diagnosis, you see that. And um, I think the biggest thing is read the room, right? Mm, um, as one. well as, uh, you know, be aware of your surroundings. You know, growing up, my father always taught me that. He's like, you know, always be aware of your surroundings, no matter what. You know, I used to sell produce in Haymarket as like a kid, 13, 14, 15 years old, you know. Um, whole different jobs where you always had to be aware. And I think that's where it comes down to is I was unaware a lot of that mental health. Um, I think structure is huge. Routine, keep it simple. You know, these these terms that we hear, whether it's an AA or NA, and, you know, uh, keep it simple, live in the day, one day at a time. It's so true. It's like the simplicity and keeping it basic. You know, wake up, you know, hit your knees, meditate, make your bed. Those are three good positive things that you're putting out into the universe before you start your day. Um, you know, just structure, I think is huge. And what I've seen was, you know, we complicate things a lot. And especially myself, it's like, you know, when I pray in the morning, and I always say this, you know, prayer, I was told is, you know, is, is the, is the wedding, right? And the honeymoon is the meditation. And that's the truth. And, you know, when I hit my knees, I ask, you know, I'm not perfect. Please take away my character defects. Help me, you know, take away my selfishness, my dishonesty, my self-seeking motives so that I can open myself out up to help others um, in whatever way that looks like, you know. Um, and that's huge right there because right there, you know, getting you out of your own head is where you're getting away from that mental state of anxiety, stresses. You know, I have stresses every day. You know, I, I, I have my businesses, I have my family, I have my relationship. I call it the circle, right? And it's like, you know, uplift will be going well, the shop will be going well, my relationship's lacking. You know, my relationship will be going well, shop's going well, but my family's lacking. And it's like, you're always on this balance and it's like a beam. But, you know, if you just keep it simple in one task at a time and having that routine and having that structure, things get easier. You know, I, I truly believe, I was just reading, not to uh, keep going, but... I Keep just going. seen a, uh, a meme and it was like, you know, a Netflix show comes on and, you know, it's slow at the start yeah, or yeah. it's kind of like boring. And, and I was reading this this meme and it was like, uh, you know, but you get to around the people and they're like, oh, keep going. You know, it gets better. It gets better. You know, if life was as simple as somebody telling you to continue to watch that Netflix show mm. and, and you just say and listen to people like Jay and, and people in this room, you know, it gets better. It gets better. Like and you actually put that in perspective, it does. Everything falls into place, no matter what. And, um, you know, to share with you, when, especially when my sister passed, I was in the middle of a haircut when I got the call on my sister. And uh, what do you think I did? I finished with that haircut. That was a form of meditation to get me in my element to make sure that I had my armor so that I can go face my family and be content and be prepared for what's next because I knew everything was going to work out. When I flipped my car over going 140 miles an hour, I had a friend in the front seat who recently just reached out to me on Christmas Day um, who I owed an amends to. And um, I'll just never forget. And I put my hand out and the car was flipping over and I was like, we're going to be all right. Like I knew that things would get better. You know, that sacrifice, that regret and, you know, God, God bless everybody, you know, that had been involved in that accident. But I'm here today and I'm living proof. And I, I truly believe that I've helped more people than I've hurt in my life. Mm -hmm. And if I have hurt those, you know, I, 
I apologize. And, you know, at the end of the day, I hope that that helped you learn through your journey, just like my faults have helped me get to the place where I'm at. And that's through routine and uh, community and having the right people around me on a day to day. That's having a strong sense of faith. Right. And, and, uh, and, and as for people in early recovery, it, that's a process that's de- de- uh, developed over time. Right. And so why well, I always tell everybody, you have to become a student to, uh, of this. Uh, you have to become a student and, and have a strong sense of humility, uh, humility, um, and be willing to learn. Right. And, 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 and it's tough because we, we come into this process and when you don't have a full understanding of the disease of addiction, um, you, you, it's very hard to navigate it, right? So like the first thing for me, I always tell people is learn about what you suffer from. And, and I say it constantly, it's only until we understand the depths to the darkness to which we suffer can we understand what is required to get us back to the light. And, and I used to have a coach that used to tell me all the time when uh, basketball, when he, the old like, uh, I know you've probably heard this saying practice makes perfect, but that's fucking bullshit. Perfect practice makes perfect. And, uh, and so you have to know like what, what you're practicing, like, and, and, and why you're practicing. And, and it's about having the necessary information, right? First and foremost. So like being a student, finding people to teach you the disease of addiction concept or alcoholism or SUD and, and to understand like, and this will segue into like the meditation, right? Why it's so important for me to understand the disease centered in our mind talks to us in our own voice and it creates narratives from which these narratives we base our life off of, right? The creator of the reality, right? The subconscious mind doesn't decipher between what is fact or fiction. It just takes the information that we feed it and brings it into the external world, which means all the belief systems and narratives and all these things become a byproduct of your broken brain, which is the disease of addiction, which will ultimately keep us trapped and imprisoned for long lengths of time. And, and what our disease does is it gives us these excuses to why this is happening to us to justify and validate it. So when you lay in the victim mentality, it becomes easy, right? It becomes easy. And what we do is we develop a pattern of just trying to feel better, just trying to fix feelings. Instead of fixing the mind, we're just trying to fix the feelings that are being created by the mind without having an understanding that our mind is doing all this. So that may sound like mind fuckery to someone that doesn't understand, but if you simplify it like, and I'll probably talk about it every week on this podcast because I'm a firm believer that repetition is the mother of all skill. And it's through the repetitive nature of hearing the same things over and over again that it inf- infiltrates into the cycle of thought. It's the reason why when you go to meetings, it's mantra driven. They say those, you just repeated three of them. Keep it simple just for today. You know, no, don't use no matter what. Like they, they say it every fucking meeting. They don't say it once a month. Oh, we said this, we chanted this last week. Let's not chant it again. There's a reason why they're... They're, they're, they put things into the mantra because they're trying to break into the cycle of thought. Why is it important to break into the cycle of thought? It's because it's only until we begin to change the way that we think can we then change the circumstances that uh, are created based off of that, right? Which is the internal suffering because we suffer the emotional repercussions of our mind, whether the shit that we're thinking is fucking real or not, mm. which is how fucked up is that? And then you tell that to a, a, a person in early recovery... On that one. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this and you will find your strength. That's it, baby. Mm, uplift. Uplift. <laughs> what a perfect a little quick segue. segue. Hey, what, what, what is that the lime one? It's the peppermint, bro. That's, that's the peppermint. That's, this that's is, but this started. is the shit right Let's here. Go. And when you understand this, right, this, this saying, Marcus Aurelius. 3,000 years ago, 2,000. Yeah, it's 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 the it's the foundation. Like well, that all makes sense because then when you when I say that to people in early recovery, you suffer the emotional repercussions of your thinking, whether it's real or not. Then they understand like the early recovery emotional fucking roller coaster because you're just your <laughs> your body's like I'm just translating emotion that makes no fucking sense. Which is why if you're early in recovery and you were gung ho an hour ago, and then an hour after that you were like fuck this, I can't do it, and then two hours later you felt hopeful, and three hours later you were like I can't do this, and five hours later you're like I miss her, and six hours later you're like I hate that bitch, mm. and you and you're feeling all the emotions of just these random fucking thoughts that are coming through. That is why it's uh, we we have to do the work and understand like. Uh, why we're equipping ourselves with these tools to sort through that cl- that clutter to get to our clarity. I'm listen. I'm yeah. I wanna, shut me up, listen, dude. Because I, I just I just I just want to apologize so because I can't get this off of my mind. You talking about the motherfucking gladiator right there? Is that Marcus Aurelius the <laughs> gladiator? That's the uh, true emperor of Rome. Oh That's my oh, yeah. god, dude! And, uh, you know. I couldn't. I I was trying to listen to Chris, but. <laughs> 
like in my defense, I listened to him a lot, and then I was like, "Is that the gladiator, Marcus Aurelius?" Like when he picked up the uplift, I thought he was gonna start styling my beard. Or something. <laughs> He's like, "I'm, hey, I'm gonna real distract real time, him to, to stop hey, talking and just do his beard." No, no, no. Hey. no. So I mean, real quick. On that. When he said it, I wanted to be like, are you not entertained? Well, you know, when we came up with this, right, this is a byproduct of my life. It's not like I'm here to, you know, do a sales pitch, right? Come on. This is the first product that started on my kitchen stove and I was in a really dark place of my life. And uh, when we discovered that, you know, I I try to go back and I wanted a fortune cookie on my products, right? Marcus Mm. Aurelius, this is simple stuff. You know, Socrates, the stuff has been going on for thousands of years. And the simplicity and their messages, that's what I used to use in my, my group, is I'd make a little bit of, you know, a history class and how to adapt these simple principles into your life, right? You know, we have power over, um, you, you have power over your mind, not outside events, realize this and you'll find strength, right? So this was 2,000 years ago. You have power over your mind, not everybody else, right? Yeah. You didn't cause it, you can't control it, right? You can control your thoughts, you know, and... Um, is there a different one on each? Each like, product. There is, yeah. okay. So this is our stronghold pomade, and then I get the clay and, you know, Lao Tzu, right? It was, uh, your life is like a piece of clay. Don't let anyone else mold it for you, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So, like, that's how, how powerful this stuff is for me. It's not a product. It's a byproduct of my life, you know? And Jay's been quiet over there. I'm going to let him jump in, but, you know... Simplicity of signs that are. He's like, yo, you've been quiet. Just, just jump in. Jump he's in. like, but he's like, I feel really uneasy right now because Jay's <laughs> quiet. <laughs> yeah, I'm just happy that Rocco finally came on and that we we got this going a couple weeks ago. And and Rocco's one of the first names that I knew, and I already been knowing that I was going to bring his name up because, like how I am with Street Smart, that's how he is. He's very passionate with uplift. And I am going to touch back on some things that you already had mentioned before, because I know a big motivating factor for Rocco was his brother. I believe I personally was a product of my environment. I believe I was born an addict. Um, that's just, that's my story. Not everyone relate with, relates with that. However, Rocco lost two sisters and his brothers also in recovery as well. And I know for me, personally speaking, recovery and anything positive um, I don't even want to say it didn't seem obtainable because I wasn't really around it. So it just was something that was not in my thought process. Now, when I started to obtain a positive life and take recovery somewhat serious, I started to think differently. Therefore, that looked attractive to my brother. And my brother's also in recovery. And my brother's part of this, you know, shout out to Josh. Um, yep. And, and I know that that's similar with Rocco. And I even spent time with them the other night. And, and his, his brother's a successful realtor and, and in recovery and, and um, someone who I'd like to eventually get on the podcast as well. But I know that that became a real life obtainable thing to you is that when you saw Mikey doing good, then you realized that you it, that Rocco could take it upon himself. And, you know, real quick, I, I met Rocco a few years ago and right off the rip, with like our first conversation, even though I had just met him, we had similar mindset and we also had a, a mutual friend, which, you know, unfortunately has lost his life, uh, his battle with addiction, um, Keith Mize. Um, and I painted Rocco's barbershop. And since then, which was about four years ago, I think, right, Rocco? Maybe yeah, four years maybe ago? five at this point. Yeah, yeah f- we become great friends because just like Chris or just like Eddie, just like any guy you see on this panel... When I find people, shout out to Marshall who's in the building, who I gave a shout out to last week, who's here with us. The fire Marshall. Well, I look around this room right now, and any guy I know personally, I trust and care about and have had those conversations because those conversations click another atmosphere in my brain. They really do. I always was subjected to negative thinking, and now by speaking my truth and, and having these positive conversations about recovery and anything that we've just talked about in this last half hour, I now know that having a life worth living is a real thing. So therefore I will speak passionately. That's why Rocco, I see this motherfucker go above and beyond the shit that he doesn't post about and doesn't talk about. And we talk about family and wanting to be a better man. This motherfucker has dedicated his whole life to uplift. That's why I rock that shit just as much as street smart. That's real shit, bro, because he comes from the same shit that we do. And, um, even though I've been quiet, I've been liking to listen to everyone. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, shit, I have a mic in the Well, I knew too. he was going to, because <laughs> yeah, especially just, he's been saying to me, he's been, like, wanting me to meet you forever. And mm. it's like, you're similar to where I am. Like, I have kids. We have businesses. We have our own, like, it's and it's 
And Jay, Jay gets hyped up on very few people in life. You know what I mean? And he's been talking about you for, for a long time. And, uh, and, and I knew that he was, he was going to just kind of fucking, it's almost like he's getting to, to see us interact, all of us interact for the first time live. And he's just like, see, I told you he's the man. <laughs> yeah. I told you about yeah. Rocco. And like all proud in the, oh, in the fucking man. corner. Like that's my boy. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. that shit. Yeah. But As I would do the same, you know? No, nah, absolutely. For sure. I, and, 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 and I love when, when, when Jay's a very good judge of character too. And, and, and I love when, when, uh, he gets excited to, for, for someone that, that's like doing this type of shit too. And, and, and I would love to speak to your brother, anybody that's doing the damn thing that's in this, that can be a, a power of, uh, example and a sense of motivation. Cause there's nothing fucking special about the four of us up here. There's not, we weren't like handpicked by God. We weren't. It was like you come to a point where you have to make that choice. Am I willing to surrender for something and, and no longer surrender for nothing, right? Mm. And, and, and I'll beat that over everybody's fucking head every episode. You can't escape. Pay me now, pay me later. Either way, you're going to pay the toll. The uncomfortabilities that you must go through are inescapable, and you can't. And, and we can try to just re, re-roll the dice, mix up the deck and all that shit, but no matter where you go, there you are. And there's always going to be that main issue that needs to be addressed, which is you. Right. And, and, but that is, that is the, the most powerful thing that you can do self discovery and evolution of self mm-hmm. getting to a point where you can go into pl- like a place of meditation. Right. Like for me, and, and I would like you to touch on this because I struggled with meditation in the beginning. And that was because I didn't understand how I suffered and why I suffered. Right. So I, I allowed my thoughts to dictate to me a sense of self. I would put truths to them. Right. And obviously I didn't like the way that those truths made me feel because I didn't understand that it wasn't who I was at where it was where I was in that current moment. So what I would do is I'd close my eyes and that wave would come over and, and I'd start to get fucking attacked by me mm. and, and all this trauma and all this stuff and this heinous shit. And I'd open my eyes back up after a few and be like, why the fuck do people do that? <laughs> <laughs> Same, bro. I and it was it was terrible. But. In time, I realized, and, and years later, I went back to meditation. And, and ultimately, when you will, when you, and obviously, I read Eckhart Tolle, and I started to, I became a student. And, and then what, what would happen for me is you start to sit through those waves. And maybe the first set of waves that come through was like all this awful shit. And, and it's like all these terrible thoughts. And then, and then the second wave that comes through is a little more terrible. But then if you just continue to sit into it, and, and not in a place of, of resistance, you just, because what we resist persists. So in, in, instead, just kind of be aware, aware of your thoughts. By the fourth or fifth wave, I, it would start to change, right? And I would start to be able to sit there and it would start to quiet. And then I would almost start to, to get into this place of positive self-talk, mm. you know, and some hopeful stuff. And then I would, I would attach onto that because I liked the way that that made me feel, which would then pull into some, some, some new thinking. So... What was your experience like getting to that place of, of being able to meditate and have, you, have that be a tool in your belt? Have you read Ecto Totale? I've touched on just about every Is that form. The guy that Chris said's cousin, because that's definitely not the same name. <laughs> Eckhart, Eckhart Tolle. <laughs> Eckhart Tolle. Ec- <laughs> totally. Yeah. I think I, think no, I ex- just stepped <laughs> in some of that. You know, like, yeah, yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh. But uh, to get back onto the meditation, oh, man, I mean, my mother. Was, it's a Reiki master, and um, I got my first singing bowl in, back in, uh, I don't know, 12 years ago prior. But, you know, just to keep it basic, there's no wrong way of meditation, right? Um, it's another quote that I love by uh, Osha, you know, one who lives in meditation needs not to meditate. A sense mm. of flow, you know, Bruce, Bruce Lee, be like water, mm. right? And to touch on water, you know, and I used to use in the class was, you know, water gets through everything. It could be, you know, it can leak through anything. You can get water damage. You know, it can go through rocks. It can go through a stream. Water gets through anything, right? And it's never, like, di- water can't be damaged, right? We're also built up of water. So how water flows is how I like to feel, right? But it's funny, you know, I, you're feeding two beasts. And I think me and Jay actually talked about this a couple of years ago when we were at that recovery high school, right? Right. It's like water can be two things. It can be a hurricane, it can be, you know, natural catastrophes, tsunamis, you name it, right? But water also purifies the world, right? You can't survive off of water. You need to survive with water. Um, it grows the plants, you know, it, it feeds the life of earth and, and what we, 
you know, live for, right? So you can be two forms of water. Which one are you going to be? A catastrophe? Or are you going to be a purified source mm. to live, right? So it's like you can feed these two beasts. And um, I always go back to that, you know, the sound of water. When we do meditations, I was just touching that I was in a car wash and listening to that water. I also, you know, um, function in chaos, right? So yeah. different mm. ways of, you know, meditation, whether that's breathing exercises or, you know, closing your eyes, you know, for three, four seconds and then opening them or a little, you know, different types of Wim Hofs, you know, Wim Hofs or whatever. You can have so many different types of meditation, right? It's whatever works for you. There's no right or wrong way to meditate. It's what works for you. You know, I like to think when I'm behind the chair, I'm out of my own head. I'm cutting hair. That's a form of art. That's flow. When Jay's painting, whether he's doing graffiti, he's not thinking about the nonsense of outside world. He's, mm. he's focusing on his color palette, right? Mm. And you, use, you do construction, right? It's like and stuff that you've done, you know. You have I that, don't, but I'm going to shake yeah. my yeah. head. Well, and say, yeah, yeah. You, I know, like, you yeah. dabble in everything. Yeah, but yeah. anyways, that sense of flow, right? You marshal <laughs> with his music, right? You're not thinking of anything else besides the flow and what's coming out. That's a form of meditation in its own way. And a lot of people don't understand that. They think you got to get quiet, right? It's like, no, you can like ride in a motorcycle. I see things when I, I used to ride, driving the same routine to work every day that I'd be in a car, but it looks different when I'm on, on a, uh, a motorcycle, right? And I like to think we had the wrong eye prescription on, right? It's like things look different when you can quiet that mind, but it also can always look different whether you're in a regular routine and how your mind sets, you know, like me for meditation, if I don't have time, you know, I, I make that two, three, four seconds count, right? And it's whether you're getting quiet or or you're behind the chair or whether you're driving or you're in the gym, right? In the gym is the number one, right? It's like that ego sets in quick, you know? I, I just got back to the gym and I'm like, people looking at me, you know, like, like you know what I mean? That ego gets sick, right? No, you, you do look big of yeah, the last no, time I stop, see you. Stop, stop, yeah. stop. But like I used to do a little bit of jujitsu, not much, you know, and uh, what I loved about it is and I do want to get back to it, trust me, um, is I'm not on my phone. There's no distraction. There's no competition. you got guys half your size that are crawling you like a tree. You know mm. what I mean? Climbing you up and choking your ass out. And it's like that sense of flow, right? And it's supposed to be the gentle art of jiu-jitsu. Me, I wrestled in high school. I'm going after the 275-pound guy until he blows my meniscus out, right? Yeah. Career ended. But that sense of flow, it, it's subjected to everything you do, just like Nike, Right. Nike goes back thousands of years, not just Nike as the sneaker, you know, the just do it. Yeah. Right. People ask me like, you know, barbers, especially training or if they're doing a test, just do it. Like, do it. It's your element. You're here for a purpose. What's your purpose? Find it and do it. Nobody else matters. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like nobody can take that from you. Your element is your element. That's your safe space. That's your sanctuary. No matter what it is, you find that white light, you find that bubble, you find that that mojo and you just do it simplicity is key we overthink that's when you get messed up you know simplicity just do it right i love that i you i, I have to to jump in on this well i don't give a fuck if either of you two wanted to to jump in on because you talk nah, about the flow just state. do it just, just do, do it. it that's yeah. right i was i was just <laughs> because the flow state i tell people about this all the time and so when we try to understand like all right why like I'll give suggestions, right? And for me, the antidote to the disease that we suffer from is connection, honesty, and relentless communication. And within that, we start to get a sense of clarity, right? And in and, and the honesty component, first and foremost, you need to understand that you're, you're not your thoughts. You're not, this isn't who you are. This is essentially where you are. And in order to become or get reacclimated with who you are, you have to allow yourself to be, which is who you presently are in this moment and understand that it's okay to not be okay. And sometimes you're fucked, Right. And, and, and embrace that. And, and, and this is the whole part that I'm talking about is when we understand the depths of the darkness to which we suffer. Right. We have to look at it in the fucking face, but understand that that isn't who we are. Mm. We need to acknowledge that to get back to who we are. That's where we are. So why do we do that? Right. Because when I'm in this place of complete transparency, when I sell, uh, surround myself with people, right, human beings, the community sense. Right. And even Carl Jung, a clinical psychologist, talked about this a long time ago, that what he could see fit for addicts struggling with addiction was uh, community and connection, which would create that spiritual uh, awakening, essentially. And that was a clinical psychologist. But we get to that place because I need to be able to free myself of the confines of me. Mm -hmm. And 
And you fearlessly need to, because that's being truly being in a state of humility, allowing people to see you completely, right? Which is vulnerable as fuck, especially for men, right? Because we suffer from false pride and ego heavy in the beginning. And, uh, and for some reason, we like to pretend like our feelings don't get hurt. We don't get depressed. We don't have low self-esteem. We don't have vanity issues. We don't have body dysmorphia that we don't, we don't get sad. We don't cry. And instead we're, we're the captains of good in you, which keeps us <laughs> in this, this constant state of suffering, right? Suffering through the suppression of our truth, uh, which isn't even actually real, but how I tie all this back in, because I'm, I'm ranting, to bring that back to the flow state, I tell people this is why you're doing this, right? Because if you want to get to that place of path and purpose and finding meaning, we have to get some clarity, some clarity of self. So we have to free ourselves of the confines of ourselves so we can get reacclimated with the sunlight of the spirit, which for me, I call that being in the flow state, that internal sense of knowing, right? When I tell people God calls, I answer. My life for the past, I mean, I'll have 17 years in March, and not all of that has been like fucking it's peaks and valleys, baby. I was ignorant in the beginning and I didn't understand and I was resistant and I kicked and screamed and I didn't believe in it. And, and yet I stayed clean based off external circumstances. Eventually enough pain led me into actually surrendering and suffering forward to actually doing the work. And during that time, which is around the five year mark, when I started to free myself and actually become honest, I started to get acclimated with that internal sense of knowing, which led me into being in a flow state. And what I call a flow state is, is being guided by that. It's like, and it's so hard to explain for people, especially in early recovery. I can always see when people are like, the fuck is this crazy dude talking about? And like, trust me. That's mm. what I was just saying. Trust me. <laughs> I started this process off as just a heroin addict from Lynn Mass. You know what I mean? Like I wasn't some fucking like just smart dude. Yeah. Like I'm stupid by like what I've, I've. I don't have education, right? You're stupidly smart is what That's you are. it. Yeah, yeah. I'm street like, smart, baby. Streetsmartstudios.com. Yeah, yeah, ridiculously <laughs> smart. Like. But that, that, that internal sense of knowing is, has led me into like, you, you just get this, this like, uh, this is where I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. Although logically it may not make sense to other people, right? It's like my whole life hasn't logically made sense since I, I've been trusting in that internal a lot of people classify me as crazy right because you start to listen to that part of you that's guiding you saying like start this business go to this place help this person take this person in, give this person money you know what i mean start this thing go here you can i mean a lot of people that that don't that don't know my story it's like uh, that internal sense of knowing with five years clean told me to quit roofing and become a dancer now how can an, a logical mind a 26 year old that's never taught never taken dance uh, that just had a, a, an internal passion because in high school he was a funky white boy and he loved it. And all of a sudden he got this feeling like, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm six years clean. But, but logically it's like, what are you talking about, kid? I don't know the, the transition from roofers to fucking to dances, but I'm pretty sure the statistics aren't high. That was my beginning process of a flow state. So how did I get to that point where I was being told that? I just finished a fourth step. I had just finished the fourth step and I had been in this place of constant truth for almost a year and a half that 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 disease wasn't used in my suppression to to fucking take me out of myself constantly by beating me up with my own shit and that I actually had some sense of clarity and my spirit started to talk and it was telling me like this isn't our life this isn't what we're supposed to be doing mm. this is what we're supposed to be doing chase it and then my fear which is my disease or whatever would be like, well, you can't. But that knowing was like, oh, no, we're we, we doing this. And that's where I started to develop and talk to a lot of people. It's like, you don't have to understand the how. The how works itself out. The identification of the what is what's important, right? And when you get that sense to follow it, and you, I mean, I know, Jay, you, you've had experience with this. And like, when you weren't ill, when you weren't equipped and you didn't have these tools and your head tells you like, we should do this. And then I mean, your, your, your spirit will start to tell you, like, we should do this, we can. And then your head's like, ah, oh, we can't do that, we'll fail. You know what I mean? Or don't even bother. Or, or you start to give yourself 150 excuses of why you can't, which washes away the one good idea. It's like the flow state is like there is no questioning, right? You're just doing. You're yeah, just trusting. Like, well, coming from yeah, flow yeah, state for me, for the yeah. longest time before recovery, I always knew that failing only existed if you stopped, yeah. right? So I, I loved fucking painting and doing graffiti <laughs> And all that shit since I was a kid. So that was my first escape. And I've shared this on other episodes before. And like Chris says, there's certain things that will always come up because it's just who I am by nature and who I am as a person. I didn't understand or hear that term flow state until years later. But I do know that I always said 
I internally love this. I love to create. I love to paint. I didn't go to art school, none of that stuff, right? And I always just knew that that's what I liked. So even an act of addiction, that's something that was remained positive in my life was that was the was the artwork and creating. And then as I got to get into recovery years later, then I seen that I can actually take because like Chris said, there was something in me like that. I knew that my purpose was bigger than just being a graffiti writer. And then I was able to implement that into recovery. And then I was able to implement other things. Like when you were mentioning, uh, I wanted to jump in, but I liked the way that what you guys had going on with the meditation. I resisted meditation for years for the simple fact, exactly what Chris just said. If I closed my eyes and tried to be quiet with no one else around, my thoughts were very scary. And when I gave myself a chance, what worked for me personally was guided meditation. I needed a voice. I needed someone else either in the room or, or on YouTube, believe it or not, that was this peaceful, soft-spoken voice that was guiding me, telling me things to do. And I did. I got to these other levels where I was like, oh, I'm not a piece of shit. Or some of the things that were screaming at me were my own actions that I was revisiting. And I realized I needed some new positive actions. When I started to implement things that weren't really my suggestions to myself that someone else said, then I started to think differently. And then now I started to enjoy meditation because there's times I've sat there with myself and got the answers that I was thought that I should say that I thought I was scared to get. How do you go towards, you know, making a legitimate business or making your passion be like your career, which that didn't seem realistic years ago. You know, when Chris talks about being in the roofers union and stuff like that, I had been on my path and purpose for years. So when I come across, even to this day, whether it's a client, a friend or whatever, once I see that someone's into something, I'm that fucking hype man, bro. I really am. What do you like? I've seen people like the gym so much that they turn being a personal trainer into a career. I've seen people like to cut hair. Maybe it's because they cut people's hair in bids. That's it. They just did it in jail. And then they end up having a barbershop or they traveled and, and whatnot. And I, to this day, and it's not going to change, I constantly live in a flow state. And for me, on a, on a different level of it, is I create even when I don't want to. You know what I mean? I do. I paint when I don't want to, even if there's not a job lined up. I, uh, I'll run group. I, I, you know, I have a schedule and there's times where I want to get someone to cover, but I've never left a group or a meeting or whatever and was like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And my flow state for me is do it even when you're not motivated because as humans, we're not always motivated. You're not always in the mood to uplift someone. And I know that because I know Rocco personally. We have to have these private conversations sometimes. And guess what? After that phone call, I am then uplifted. Mm. No, for real. And that's not even like a plug. It's just what it is. That's why that 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 brand and, and how he is, and it's a mindset, how you read the quote off the side. You said it's been going on for 2,000 years because if it's not broke, don't fix it. The simplest quote is motivating even 2,000 years later. Do you know what I mean? So um, I just, uh, I don't know, man. That the, the, the whole flow state, when you said that, my brain just kept going because that's how I am today. If I want to go further in life, I have to stay in that flow of doing the things repetitiously, even on days I don't want to do it, man. Yeah. You know, for real. Yeah. I, uh, not to, you know, just to jump in <laughs> that flow state, we're all energy, right? Like yeah. the light bulb and like people would ask, you know, well, how's Reiki work? How's this? It's like you are energy, right? So I could come in here and I could slam a door and it's going to change the whole energy in the room. You know, be that energy that's lifting everybody in the room and being aware of your surroundings and, you know, talking amongst and not at people. And, you know, it goes back even to the start of recovery. It's like, you know, your God, my God loves me, right? It's like, I'm not getting punished for my, my sins and all that. It's, it's helping me fix right, you know, wrong from to right, you know, and, and the things that you always talk about, Jay, is like having that love, right? Whether that's that guided meditation and having a safe place and having somebody that you can trust as like a brother or a father figure or just a friend, mm. right? It's that it's being vulnerable. It's like we're so vulnerable. Um, and it's important to have that love in your life, you know, and you have to, and, and to your passion, right? It's like, I, I read another quote, quotes. I love quotes. I just, Same, I always, too. I love them. Right. And, and I feel quotes. like God or well, whatever's out there gives me these signs that I need to read at that time. You know, I was just seeing another one. I don't know if it was Kanye or what, you know, um, it was, you know, would you still believe in something and do it every day if no one else believed you or believed in what you were doing? 
fucking right. Damn fucking straight. I did it my whole Because I'm not doing this, you know, this is life or death, whether that's street smart, whether that's process, what's what's that's uplift or you like I do this because I have to, right? Like this isn't no like tiptoeing in. Because if I tiptoe into my addiction, I'm dead, right? I just know the type of addict I am. If I'm in, I'm all in, mm. right? I'm 110% in whatever I do. I can't be outworked because I have a purpose. I have to have a purpose. I got to do things that are uncomfortable. I got to pick up the phone that when I don't want to. I got to get up when I don't want to, you know? I have to do that stuff because it keeps me going. Mm. And that gives me my own recognition that I need, that I've always longed for since I was a kid was recognition, right? Mm. Especially being the youngest in my family and stuff. It's like I was mm. at my aunt's wake yesterday and, um, you know, you died too young, cancer. It's like, what do you even say about cancer, right? We lose friends every day to addiction. Plus, like, I'm sure it's combined probably 500 people in the last 10 years of my right to addiction. But then you hear the, you know, my aunt was the hottest working woman in my, that, in my life, right? Like, I watched this woman work 16-hour days. She was a hairdresser in South Boston, right? And, um, you know, she died at 63 years old. And it's like, she just retired. She didn't even get to retire and enjoy that time. It's like, you know, the people that I would see in the interactions that I had at her wake, it's like, I think about that stuff. You know, if I die, who's going to show up? What's going to be said? What are those conversations that are going to be had with my family and my loved ones when I pass? Right. You know, and, and I'm, I don't want to use the word numbing to death because I believe that there's something out there after we pass. Right. You know, so like when I see my sister, uh, you know, people that were in a casket, right? Like even when I, I got asked, to, you know, no names, of course, cut a 17 year old kid's hair on a metal table. You know, when he passed for the family, it's like their soul has gone. I'm just looking at flesh, a body. It's nothing. I know that there's something so much greater out there. And I have to believe in that because that's what gets me up all out of my bed every day is faith. Right. Mm. So it's like to have that stuff and, and have these interactions with my aunt was a hairdresser. Right. Her clients were there. Oh, you're the barber. You're the nephew. It's like, you know, yeah, that woman laying right there, she had a huge role in my life and my journey for what I've done. You know, my 14th birthday, I got a pair of clippers and I never put those things down. Mm. Am I perfect at it? No, but it got me out of my own head and it was able to give me as an outlet to help others, right? Just like mm. Jay with his art. I remember, I'll never forget, we were in the recovery high school and you were in front of those kids, right? 15 years old, IV heroin users. What if I told you that your art you can make a career out of? And their heads were like, whoa. It's like, damn straight. I've been cutting hair since I was 14 years old. I created a hair product. I give back to a nonprofit, The Family Restored, for families struggling with addiction, right? Because that's my life. I've taken everything that I stand for and I've put that action into a purpose. And who follows it and who needs to follow it, follows it. And who doesn't, that's not my team, right? Mm. It's like, I'm out there for those that need this life or death and have that experience. If not, what are we, right? It's like, you need to have that purpose and you will find it if you look far enough, right? And you got to get out of your own head. And that's where we, I leave that at. It's like, I knew what I was destined to do and I'm going to do it. And no one's going to stop me. You sound like a man with conviction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sound like a man with conviction, brother. And, and mm. conviction comes from evidence, right? Evidence through the data that we collected through the experiences of our life, right? Through where I am today by connecting the dots, looking backwards. Right. Cause, and we talk about this all the time. Me and Eddie were just talking about conviction, like conviction in our faith and our belief. Right. And, and, and wh whomever you want to believe in, that's fine. I believe in God and I'll even take it one step forward. I'm on, me man. and Ed, me and Eddie are Jesus dudes. You know Come what I mean? On, the story of Jesus and the collection of misfits and the ultimate, like trying to forgive. And even if you don't even believe in him as whatever, what he represented <laughs> in, in humanity and in society, like the unconditional love. And then that to his very last days, his last words, father, forgive them for they don't know that they sin and like everything, all that. And like, and, and for me, like in my process, like understanding, like, be always going from this place of like looking to be forgiven and it's like desperate to to be shown grace for my missteps and what especially in the beginning when i don't know didn't understand that I was a human being suffering from human frailty and all these other fucking things and that mistakes was an inevitable part of my life but they weren't going to define me they were there to teach me lessons right and and now I understand that now so I can look back in hindsight at everything even some of the darkest moments of my life and uh and I can see God's hand and 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 getting me through eddie says we he he just we talk about this all the time god won't god won't uh prevent the storm but he'll deliver us through mm. and i've been delivered through so many times right 
And, and it's even like looking back, right? My stepfather, he's who raised me. My biological father was in jail until I was like 18, 19. And he eventually passed away January 29th, um, which is my birthday. But my stepfather raised me and he also passed away January 29th, which was my birthday. Uh, seven years apart, they passed away. But when my stepfather, um, when he passed away, uh, it was a tough period of our lives, right? And, and I could identify so much with what you were talking about with, with, with your sister. And I had my two younger brothers and my sister and my mother in like this dark, this dark place. And it was, my, our lives were flipped upside down. And it was very, it was fucking painful. And, uh, and I had just begun establishing like a powerful relationship with him at this point because we didn't speak for a long time because I was fucking running amok in him and my mother's life. So now you fast forward a year after the date that he passed away. January 29th, my brothers and I, and a couple other friends, we auditioned for um, America's Best Dance Crew on MTV on the, the one year anniversary of that. And, um, and we ended up booking it. We ended up getting on it. And when we get on the show, we don't know what the, what the, um, well, like, cause they give you like this whole backstory and the whole season we were on there, they pretty much focused on like our father and him and our lives and the, and how he was like a stage dad. And it was like this beautiful messaging. And it was like so wild to see that God took such an awful moment in all of our lives and he delivered us through it. And now we're on national television and I'm able to like, to, to be there with my two younger brothers who are my best friends you know what i mean and experience this thing and i could feel his presence right i could feel his presence and i remember uh, just being out there and just it's so many moments man and and it's it's hard to to explain to people that that are still early on in the process but that has been my experience for a very long time looking back and seeing god's gentle loving caring and forgiving hand in my life right and delivering me through some of the most painful processes and not not only delivering me through like they were necessary parts of of my life in order to develop me and put me in the position that i am in today to become the man that i am today and to meet the people that i have in my life today who i wouldn't trade out for any other fucking reason and so like if my pain and everything that i've gone through was a necessity in order for me to have my wife and my daughter and my my sons and and these people in this room and and the the I will fucking go through it again. Yeah. Mm. I will and I'll continuously go through it. What's so crazy, both. Chris, when you just mentioned that with uh and I know we've shared this in in conversation over the years cuz we're friends, but as far as being on a you know, a podcast and and, and you know, people are chimed in live and stuff. Me and Chris met in a fucking gym, right? And this dude bounced off the idea, like, I'm a, I'm a hip-hop, like, I like hip-hop dancing, and, 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 you know, I mentioned that I was a graffiti writer, and like I said earlier, if you tell me something you're into, bro, even if, it, it, it could be whatever, I knew that he could go somewhere with it and set it and was even with you when you went back to funk, you know? Um, one of the most powerful things ever is I remember him sharing his passion for being a hip-hop dancer, and I grew up, obviously, in the hip-hop as well. You know, it's the two elements out of the four hip hop, right? Um, this motherfucker went back and picked up choreo choreography in one night that that dudes had been working on for like a few months, right? And along the way, um, you know, I seen you do events, I seen you do shows, Celtics games, right? All this, all this shit, right? Now the reason why I'm sharing this is because every time you bring up that story, I have a tear in my eye because he also introduced me to the owners of of the dance studio, which shout out to Funk, Ray, and Rick, you know. Uh, and they had me lace up that whole studio and that developed a relationship with me that able to, to, to fan my desire to be a graffiti writer. So all the, the artwork you see in any episode we've done, no matter what room it is or street smart or, or whatever. Right. Um, that first episode, man, when they talked about, about Bill, um, I was crying at home. You have to realize, right. This is your fucking friend. That's that was there in the gym. We joke around with the Drake line like he wasn't with us shooting in the gym. And I'll forever always text that to Chris because these motherfuckers weren't with us shooting in the gym. They were the same people that said, nah, you can't quit roofing. No, you can't be a fucking graffiti writer. And I literally have always kind of had two middle fingers up with people that have talked to me like that. I was like, nah, fuck you. Watch us. <laughs> and I watched this with my ex-girl at the time and at our own apartment and and they aired this first episode man and the second they started talking about his fucking dad bro and you see nico talking with the fucking graffiti behind him man and i remember crying like a little kid but not like i mean a part of me was sad because i knew your dad 
But the other part was like, see, I fucking told you this dude would do it. I told you this dude could do it. And I've been doing that for years because you know what? No one really had like my back. So I'm always like, be the change you wish to see. Yep. And, and, and the quote that he had just said reminded me of that. And I know that's one of Chris's favorite quotes. Um, you know, and it's, it's a very powerful story. And, and, and Eddie had just put that up and I was crying the other day, the clip he put up on the, uh, somebody's TikTok, man, and, of, of Chris reliving that moment, man. And, and I'll never, I'll never forget that. And, and that's why, like, like I look at y'all as like family, right? Because those moments right there, bro, like I chased fucking $40 in fake happiness for years and that shit, I never thought that I would like seek out to want to cry, right? But those moments when you cry like that, it's emotion. It's fucking like conviction. Like when Rocco was just talking about his aunt and then Chris just jumped in and, and, and it's like, I just had a flashback to that moment, bro, because you can't even make that shit up. It's a very powerful fucking moment, bro. It and really the, the more the important, I, I don't know if that was Eddie trying to talk, but I'll let you, but the importance nope. of people and allowing God to work through people, right? Because Jay is one of those people in, 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 in my life and in many people's lives still to this day, like that you talk about a hype man and, and we require that. And when I say God works through people or whatever you want, the universe, however, it's the energy through people through that. And, and obviously you, there, there comes a responsibility of transparency, of truth, right? So you can allow yourself to, 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 to receive the help that's required. And, and, and so Jay was constantly one of the few people that like, you can do it, motherfucker, you can do it, motherfucker. And like why that's important, because in the beginning of this process, I didn't have the belief system that told me I could, it told me I couldn't and I shouldn't. And, uh, and people told me I could countless times over and over again, almost like they were offended at the idea that I thought that I couldn't. And, and he believed so much that he believed enough for the both of us. And it gave me that, that split second of like, fuck it, I'll do it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To take that step. And, 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 and it is so important, man, because people will lift you up when, when you can't lift yourself up. People will believe in you. We don't have belief in yourself. People will learn, people will love you until you learn to love yourself, man. If you allow them to, and it's the importance of connection, right? Because without connection, I'll always classify myself as unique, right? Unique in how fucked up I am. Unique in how not fucked up I am. Unique in, in something, man. It's through the people that I receive the guidance that, that I require. And, and, and not everybody's for you, right? But somebody is. Yeah. And it's, it's important to find your tribe. Say that again. Yep. <laughs> say that again. Not for Go everybody. Ahead. Definitely for no. somebody. Mm, come on. Somebody, not, you know what I mean? Not everybody will be for you. Go ahead. Say that again. Not everybody will be for you. But somebody will. Oh, you know what I mean, uh, I, had, on, I had to throw a little something. We hit up. We hit oh. like nine uplifts. And yeah, Jay was it. fucking freestyle <laughs> rapping, fucking dropping up. Like you. I love it. I love it. And, it, you know, to add to that, it's true. It's like my brother always, 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 you know, I, I seek to him. We butt heads. I love my brother to death. You know, I really do. Um, and he's always saying, it's like, you know, you got to practice what you preach, you know, and my brand is uplift. I'm not false advertising. If I'm yeah. not uplifted, I'm downshifting. Yeah. Right. You know, yep. and I live by that. And that's, that's what it comes down to. And another quote, and I, I, it drives me nuts when God gets taken out of the equation. Right. You know, I grew up believing that there's something greater out there. I have to. You know, if you yeah. don't believe in God, at least believe in yourself. But you, it's good to have that feeling or that assurance of a higher power. And a quote, you know, that stuck with me from somebody that was very important to me in my life. Um, you know, God only squeezes, he doesn't choke. Right. Yeah. And it's so true. It's like he only squeezes, he doesn't choke. And, and that growth and everything that you said and everything so powerful, that everything you guys said, but that growth and he's there in your darkest hours, right? Like he's been there for me in my darkest hours where I was able to the shit that we talk about in here to the average person would be insane, right? Yeah. Like you'd be able to tell like, yeah, yeah, I lost two sisters and, you know, I almost died in a car crash and, you know, blah, blah, blah. My best friends are all ex-IV heroin. It, the people like, Poof, like, oh, yeah. like God has given me the strength to be able to speak on that mm -hmm. and speak with that with confidence. And it's like, those are the people I break bread with because they've been through a struggle and they can understand me. Right, they can identify what I'm bringing to the table, and vice versa. And those are the people that I have to surround myself with, because that ego and that humble and that that you know all this these character defects that lead us to those. It's like that's the sickness, right? And it's not just the disease of addiction. That's mental health. That's life. It's like you are what you attract, and um, it's important to remember that there's no coincidences. Like this rum right now being powerful, like enough to bring me here and. And 
it uplifts me so that I can go and do my daily stuff. Same to everybody in here. Like it's, it's important to not forget that the, you have a purpose in life and you know, everything happens for a reason, for a reason. Right. You know, mm. it's just having faith. Yeah. You know? And what a journey it is. Right. And I, and I, and I love it. My favorite part about it is that we haven't even scratched the surface yet of what is, what's, what's possible, what's attainable. And, and you'll be lucky to in a lifetime. And, and every day I blow my mind off of like what I see, the miracle and, and, and recovery and God work in people's lives. And then my, my own life still blows my mind. Like I still can't believe that I'm a father, you know, when I'm married and, and, and I've attained. It's not even like the stuff, the things, like the external stuff. Like obviously that's cool and we should want to attain those. It's like who I am within it. Mm-hmm. Actually having the emotional connection, right? Actually able to be present and available. I remember being terrified that, um, when my wife was pregnant with my daughter and thinking like, I've always struggled with affection and, uh, I'm not a very touchy feel. I don't know, like whatever I've always struggled. So I'm like, uh, that I'm going to be a terrible, like if I'm not gonna be able to show that to a, a baby or a little, and I remember like all this fear and, uh, and then I like my daughter's born and just like the profound change. Right that that occurred Mm. and like the it's another level another level of like another part of an evolution of of self and my daughter broke open parts of me that i didn't know existed that not only was she the recipient of but many people in my life were Mm. you know like a different i became a a a different human and it's like a constant set of evolution right that's why like when I tell people like the profound effect of recovery that it takes place it's it's obviously the the desire to use and being lifted is 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 profound enough but it's not just that it's so much bigger than just not not wanting to get high or drink or it's like getting to understand the depths of self and to understand like starting to learn like who and what you are and what you're capable of and the unraveling of all these narratives that created barriers to entry and all these things that we wanted to attain that we witnessed from other people attaining whether it be affection love um being present smiling being comfortable or being able to socialize and all this stuff and to actually experience that over time and start to even just now in this moment right and i tell this i say this to people all the time Right now, this moment is the only thing that I'll ever truly be real. And in this moment, if you really get acclimated to it and connect, you realize that you're already all right. You're already all right. And like to constantly try to get yourself grounded into that state is 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 the beauty of recovery. Right. Mm -hmm. Because we've all experienced the external rewards and love and all this and been disconnected from it. And had no true emotional connection or wasn't able to be present. I've been around people that loved me obsessively and felt nothing. nothing. You know what I mean? I've yeah. been around family and felt nothing. I've been, I've owned shit that, that that's amazing to most people that I felt nothing. Mm. You know, I've given away and destroyed and burned down more shit in my life that I felt nothing towards that people are like, what? And, uh, and to be able to like have that, that level of appreciation for me, especially as I'm older, it's, it's crazy, like, this is the most important shit, the relationships that I have, the relationships with the people in my life and my family. It's like, I, I don't know what it is, like, maybe I'm, I'm 39 now, but it's like... Yeah, you're all, getting old. I'm just so, I just want, I want this, I want more moments of, like, when I'm with my kids and I'm with people that I love and I just want to... I just want to be constant. And I used to be, I used to say that I was like a nomad. I like to be by myself and I don't, now I just want to be surrounded yeah, by love. You, Why? Because I can actually give and receive it. You were, you were literally, you, you did like to be by yourself. Like that's the whole thing. Like I love, I love touching on this. A lot of you guys talked about it is like, uh, like what are you guys are talking about? Essentially is the triangle of self-obsession, right? Like, and, uh, you know, everybody's touching on anger and, and fear, Right. Like uh, not believing, like not believing, like uh, false narratives you were talking about, Chris, you know, uh, Rocco touched on on a lot of the triangle of self-obsession. Right. Like resentment, anger and fear, you know, uh, from an early age when we when we when we're born, we're born and uh, there's not a lot we can do for ourselves. Right. Like, um, you know, we can't feed ourselves. Right. We get hungry. Like, you know, baby gets hungry to start crying. Like, right. It needs to be soothed. It needs to be content. Like a diaper needs to be changed. Like 
And as we start to grow up, we start to learn to comfort ourselves, right? Like the older we get, like uh, when we're hungry to ask for food, you know, uh, crying to soothe ourselves. We Babies learn to suck on their thumbs. Like we learn to be more independent and soothe ourselves uh, the older that we get. And at some point, like uh, especially in addicts' lives, like it talks about this a lot. A lot of people talk about this is our wants, the things that we need to feel content and happy, they start becoming demands, you know? And, uh, and, and through that process, and we carry that most addicts through our entire lives as we start to get resentments, you know, and resentments lead to anger and anger leads to fear. And ultimately that's the triangle of self-obsession, right? Like, and the only way to really counteract that. And that's why I believe like, this is something that should be taught everywhere all the time, especially new in recovery. Like talk about like, yes, all three is sat here and, and talked about dreams and hopes like and self doubt. Right. And all these narratives about other people. And, and the, the fact of the matter, it was never it's never up to other people. Like you just said it. We come to this conclusion later on in our recovery that like we had the key to the door the entire time. Matter of mm-hmm. fact, what, Chris, the door, it wasn't even locked. It was what? It was wide open. It was man. wide fucking open, well, right? I like, thought they didn't let us in. Eddie. <laughs> hey, it, it, it's wide open. So ultimately, like uh, through our resentment, through our anger and our fear, we created our own prisons. And then what we did is we projected that onto people and we said, fuck the world. Mm-hmm. Fuck the system. Mm-hmm. These people are trying to hold me down. You're trying to hold me down. This is all negative. Hey, when I got into recovery, I believed everybody was a fucking liar, a cheat and a thief. Everybody I met. If I answered that questionnaire to become a fucking cashier and it said that most people, few people and no people steal from registers, I'd been like pretty much everybody. dude. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, because like that's who I was internally. And, and in order to counteract that, in order to start to believe in ourselves and start to believe this new narrative is we have to originally work on our resentments, our anger and our fear. Because the opposite of that triangle of self-obsession, you want to talk about the triangle of selflessness and that it's like ultimately like what everybody's talking about up here. Rocco's talking about giving back. It's not about you. Like it's not about you. It's about other people. Right. So like the opposite of like a resentment would be acceptance. Mm-hmm. The opposite of anger would be love. And the opposite of fear would be faith. So when we find that we, we're in recovery and we start to live in acceptance, love and faith. Everything else fucking works out mm-hmm. despite ourselves or anybody else. You know, it, it's beautiful. I love the stories. And I just wanted to give a quick shout out to one of the realest motherfuckers to ever do it. While you were talking about having a, a child and stuff, my man, Trey Rich, uh, having a baby boy. Congratulations, my man. Yeah. Shout out to Trey. That's his brother. That's my baby brother. We my just, baby's yep, having a baby. That's his baby. <laughs> we just can't. We just had his baby shower through the weekend. And uh as he was talking about all those fears and, and you know, cause go, it's funny cause God equips us for all that, even though we don't know it, yeah. it's kind of like the uh, footprints in the sand, you know, like the funny thing is like, even when we think we're alone and we're in this situation that we're never going to get through or we can't and the fears there, it's like God's with us. You know oh, what I yeah. mean? Like, and it shows you had the, you had your baby with all those fears and stuff and everything just magically worked out. Yeah. Magic, now I just man. keep having them. Now yeah, my no, wife's now like, you another won't one. Stop. Like, another one. My wife's like DJ fucking Cali. <laughs> yeah, another one. Another She's one. Pregnant she really right <laughs> she's pregnant right now. She's pregnant right now. We're having a boy, another boy, and she's already talking about wanting to have another one because she wants to go. I was there for she's that conversation. Yo, everyone has a path and purpose. Right? Listen, to listen, be a mom. she just she's the, listen, she's the best mom. Shout she's, out to the moms for yeah, sure. She's like a pro mom. She just wants another girl. I know. For Viv, and she stay sister. at home. She's a beast. I Sam, could never do it. I could. She's. Uh, yo, you keep going. You're gonna have your own start in five dog. Sam, yeah. I got Sam. I got. I got. I got Sam's back. Listen, Shout out she, to Sam. She need. She needs a girl. And I thought literally. I thought Sam was in luck because when Rocco came on and Jay said. Rocco's coming from Uplift. I thought we were about to get some ED medication. I was like super pumped up. <laughs> like, Ooh. hey, I was so fucking excited. And uh, I'd rather that I, than be called a moving I, company. So, hey, I do, listen, a moving company. My I, man Rocco with the dick pills. I do, we are here. I do the appreciate the raincoat and the uh, and the pomade. Uh, but I was looking forward to some ED medication. Yeah, and he heard raincoats and was listen. mad excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're coming to the end of the podcast. Um, I, I just, well, 
I, I like to ask this question, and, and I'm going to ask it to you, Rocco, um, before we end it. If you could give advice to, to, to yourself in, in the earlier part of your, your recovery or the beginning of this process, that, that could help you to avoid some of the pitfalls or, or even to, to alleviate some of the, 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 the painful process of pain and the way that it motivates us to do the, the next right thing. What, what would you give yourself for advice? One who finds life finds treasures. The alchemist. It's true. Mm. Hell yeah. You know, because those wants and needs are now my headaches. <laughs> yep. <laughs> right? Hell yeah. Yeah, that's faith. Amen, brother. What do you what about you, Eddie? Uh the advice I would give to myself? Yeah. Slow the fuck down, dude. Like, hey, I love listen, you I want to hit him with a quote too, because this is my favorite quote, George Collin. Don't take life too seriously. You'll never get out of it alive. Mm. Good. Jay, what you got? Um probably don't let don't let the things that you got blessed with, like that I strive for when I was younger and early in recovery, be the things that take me out. Huh. That's ultimately what I did. Everything I like prayed for and worked for once I had that. It's not that I was like, oh, I'm good, but I definitely I I, I like tap the brakes a little and then ultimately I stopped doing everything I did to work for those things. That's why I came back uh, five years ago with a, with a burning desire to fucking never give back what I worked for. You know what I mean? If anything, to increase it as I've gotten older and, and the more time that I get, put in more work. There's just different levels of the work as I get older and, 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 and gain the time and recovery. And, and time is important. It's just that I used to focus so much on the time when I was younger. Like, oh, I got five years. Oh, I got six. I got seven. When really I see motherfuckers that got 30 days that literally have, they're more grateful and, and, and more um, motivated than I did with almost nine. You know what I mean? I was, you know, Chris, yeah. the younger version of me, there's times where Chris was like, bro, you keep heading down this path, bro. I don't know if you're going to last. And I'm, I'll never forget that. You know, so I guess that's the biggest piece of advice is don't let all the blessings that come your way be the things that, that take you out. Mm. Agreed. Hell yeah, mine is uh, all fear is is a lack of understanding. Uh, the more we understand, the less there is the fear. Become a motherfucking student. Mm. And my second one is uh, whether you think you can or you can't. Either way, you're right. So uh, can I get a second one too? No, there's no double Come dipping. Come on, listen. There's no just double dipping. Say we, had, we could have. We at two. the end of the part. Hold Are up. You, <laughs> <laughs> you could get it in after. <laughs> Shout out Uplift. What's your in your your barber shop? What's the barber shop? Over the top barber shop. 221 Main Street, Stoneham, 13 barbers, mm. ready to go. Get Uplift a Provisions, street. a portion of all sales goes back to the Family Restored, supporting families struggling with addiction and uh, virtual meetings and in-person meetings. Uh, much needed. That's a topic that we maybe for next episode about the Hell families yeah. for sure. Hell yeah. Jay, where, we, where can we get some Street Smart gear, some Sh custom art? Streetsmartstudio.com. Like, share, subscribe to next somebody's... Uh, episode on youtube hell and eddie end us end the podcast with a quote dude hit us with a mic drop i didn't want a mic drop real quick hold on you ready for this we ready how do i look i right. look good all right thank you uh no i got old sponsor used to say this all the time you know because uh my responsibilities would always ultimately take me out because they got overwhelming and i didn't like responsibility i ran away for for a long time and he told me all the time, he said, you know, at some point in your life through your recovery, you're going to find all your responsibilities are your blessings. Mm. It's true. Bam. Hell yeah. All right. Peace.